Approaching Zion. Don't follow me for April 29th through May 5th. And I know that because we put it on our slide this time. We said we were going to do it, and we did it. We followed through. <laughs> There's progress every you, week. You see how easy that was? <laughs> Didn't even have to think about it. All right. Messiah chapters 4 through 6. So this is following up last week's episode, which was fantastic. King Benjamin, everyone loves it. And now we are getting to the follow-up, the end of his great discourse and the response of the people and so much good doctrine coming out of this the cool thing about the start of these chapters is verses one through three mosiah is actually he's actually delivered the message the angel like commanded him to deliver chapter four is like now that the people have responded in a positive or affirmative way their humility and and their desire to act on the the commands of the angel. Now this is like, okay, Mosiah is receiving, or excuse me, King Benjamin is receiving like fresh doctrine, like fresh truth. Like, okay, here's where we need to go next with it. I don't know if he was initially planning on giving the rest of this discourse, but once he recognized the humility that people had, it's like, all right, where do we go with this next? And he just continued the, the doctrine and the truth. Well, let's get right into chapter 4. So, we were looking at, chapter 4 starts by, of course, the response of the people. And he talks about some key concepts here. About the people receiving a remission of their sin. And then later he talks about the people being able to retain the remission of their sins, which seems very important. Yeah. <laughs> well, we always talk in the church about receiving a remission of sin, but we kind of just stop there naturally. It's like, well, once you receive it, we kind of then talk about, you know, enduring to the end, partaking of the sacrament and stuff, but we don't really kind of bifurcate those two thoughts of receiving a remission of sins and then retaining a remission of sins and that follow-up thought of like retaining it is like oh that's not a concept we we think about very much or verbalize very often in the church so there's definitely something here that we can utilize in regards to thinking about what we're doing once we have entered the way like okay now what we're doing is helping us retain that remission of sins that we received right so, what we know is remission of sins is received through faith in Jesus Christ and through repentance. And then we always talk about baptism for the remission of sins. And we, you know, we talk about John the Baptist preaching repentance and preaching remission of sins. And then, of course, Christ being the fulfillment and the, the Christ that is able to offer and grant remission of sins. But... The scriptures talk about remission of sins maybe a little bit differently than we are used to thinking and talking about it just, you know, traditionally in, in modern church culture. And let me just see uh, chapter 4, verse 2. So, the people here all cried aloud in one voice saying, how will have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And chapter and verse 3, And it came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins. And what's interesting there is that uh, in no part of those two verses were they baptized. Mm. And we say, well, baptism is for the remission of sins. Probably if you ask, you know, majority of church members, when do you receive remission of your sins? They'll say, when you're baptized. Mm -hmm. But we see very clearly here that the people of King Benjamin, they were moved and the Spirit came upon them. And through their faiths, they received a remission of sins. 
And that maybe seems a little weird, a little contradictory, but over in Doctrine and Covenants, verse uh, section 20, verse 37, which I need to pull up, but over, over there it talks about the requirements for baptism in the modern church. Verse 37... All those who humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized to come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church they have truly repented of their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end and truly manifest by their works that they have received the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins shall be received by baptism into his church. So again, In modern times, we see that remission of sins comes from receiving the Spirit of Christ through faith and repentance, right? Mm -hmm. Truly manifesting their works of, right, the the truly acquiring faith in Christ unto repentance. Yeah. So, this is, that right there is how we obtain or receive remission of sins. It's truly through faith in Christ and repentance that faith producing works of repentance in our heart. This is where I, I feel like, and I could be, I could be wrong. So tell me if you think otherwise, but I think this is where other Christian churches get to. They get to this point and maybe without being able to conceptualize it Mm -hmm. this way, but they get to the point where their faith their love for, their desire in or or for a relationship with Jesus Christ is there. That's all real. Like, it's legit. And they receive, because this is maybe agnostic, so to speak, in regards to we're not talking about having to do this through proper authority or through proper priesthood or anything like that that's unique to the restored gospel Mm -hmm. of Christ. It's simply saying faith and repentance leading to Jesus Christ. Like you don't have to have the restored gospel for this, for this remission of sins Yep. or to receive that remission of sins for the spirit of Christ to come upon you. Yes. And this is so important so that when we're talking to other, other believers in Christ, other Christian denominations or evangelicals, whoever we have to understand why do we need to why do we need to understand what the scriptures are teaching us here because this is where evangelicals this is where other christians get to they get to that point where they can receive a remission of sins what they don't understand and and what what they can't really conceptualize very well is there is a process for retaining that remission of sins so they get to the point of i've received a remission of sins and then what do they say well i'm saved now I'm saved. I've accepted Christ. I'm saved. And what we need to do is say, yes, you have received a remission of sins. However, there is an ordained process to retain that remission of sins. And that's where... There's more to it. Yes. That's where I think we can potentially provide a lot of value Mm -hmm. in their understanding of the plan of redemption. And that's the whole argument that we always make we're not trying to take away what you have we're trying to show you that there's more yes and add to it we can bring more light and truth mm-hmm. to what you already have received from mm-hmm. christ and you know what the reason why they struggle in moving forward is because they don't have the keys to the kingdom mm-hmm. they don't have they don't need they don't have authority to truly baptize they don't have authority to um establish the kingdom of god on the earth so you know those that that's kind of as as far as they can get because of the authority or lack thereof mm-hmm. that they that they have and, and this reminds me we were talking the other day about John chapter three, where Christ is talking to Nicodemus and he says, "You have to be born again to see the kingdom of God, and then he says, "You have to be born of water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God, well, that's two different things, yeah, right being born again. Or kind of having faith unto repentance 
and being able to start seeing the kingdom of God and what it what that means is one thing. But then that truly manifesting itself and accepting that kingdom when it's presented to you and entering into it mm-hmm. by that being baptized by someone with legal priesthood authority, yeah. receiving the gift of the ghost, that's that's a different thing. So we have people who have accepted Christ, who have faith in Christ, who are are seeking and receiving a remission of sin. They're 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 applying they're they're finding and and seeking to apply his grace. They're starting to see the fruits of the kingdom of God and what, what Christ established on the earth and what he offers. Um as, where do you go from there? Well, you 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 start developing and seeking the actual legal kingdom of God, which is Christ's true church on the earth. Yeah, and that's actually really when we talked about John three previously, it wasn't with that specificity, and that's really interesting because what it allows us to do is to acknowledge and to affirm the the righteous path that other Christian believers have walked. To get them to the point which they lie in their life where they have that faith, Mm -hmm. they have received that remission of sins, but then it allows us to say, okay, but, but according to Christ's word, now we have to enter that kingdom and that can only be done through proper priesthood authority. And that is how that remission you received is retained and, and how you are able to keep that. And that's, that's beautiful. Now we have hope that we're entered that we, that we're offering these individuals for eternities to come and the key here we're talking about being a true baptism and receiving the gift of the holy ghost uh we're, yes we're talking about performing the ordinances mm-hmm. but right it's not the it's not the water of baptism that washes your sin away or that helps you become clean the remission of sins is then retained moving forward through making and keeping covenants yeah and covenants can only be made and administered through legal administrators, mm-hmm. priesthood, proper priesthood. Priesthood was restored to the earth through Joseph Smith and resides in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this is what King Benjamin goes on to teach. Now that you've now that um the Spirit has taken hold of your heart, remission of sins is retained through making and keeping covenants of higher law, starting with our willingness take upon ourselves the name of Christ, and then actually covenanting to keep and live the laws of the gospel and the law of consecration. And King Benjamin goes on to, without saying those words, he goes on to teach the principles of of, of loving God, loving your neighbor, and consecrating of your your substance unto unto your fellow man. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have in verse 26. And he says, for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God, I would that you should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath. So, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and the sick. Good works. Yeah. Right? Loving loving God, loving your neighbor. Well, Concentrating the- yourself and becoming christ-like in your attributes in your character well essentially what he's teaching is if you want to retain a remission of sins don't put temporal or celestial things above the welfare of your fellow man the the um don't put these temporal um things that can corrupt and rust and and come and go don't put that above the soul or the salvation of your fellow man that's ultimately what is getting us to focus on is we must take care of one another because that's the only way people can walk the plan of redemption, can walk the covenant path when their base needs are being met. Elder Holland gave a talk a few years ago in conference about we've got to do more to ensure the poor and the needy, the the widow or widower, those that that need an extra hand that they're taken care of because when you're in that state of temporal um uh temporal need it's very difficult to walk the disciples path at that point and so it's it's the same thing that king benjamin's teaching here is we've got to do our part to help alleviate those so that they can focus on more spiritual substance and not just the temporal substance they may be in need of we were talking earlier about um the obtaining the remission of sins prior to baptism and 
it actually, I think, becomes obvious that that's the case and has to be the case by the fact that we do vicarious work for the dead who did not have a chance to receive the gospel. Well, how how do you know, because we say if those who did not have a chance to receive the gospel but would have mm-hmm. received it if they had the chance, well, how would you know that they would have received it? Well, those people would have received, a remi- obtained, received a remission of sins in their life because mm-hmm. they would have done all that they could do up to that point, but they didn't have an opportunity or the gospel, the restored gospel was not presented unto them. So it kind of makes sense that, that that's how vicarious baptism can really be applied for the remission of sins is if those people had an opportunity to obtain remission of sins prior to their baptism or prior to having the gospel presented to them. Well, and as King Benjamin alludes to here, it's about being being humble, having that humility and being stripped of pride. And there surely are countless numbers of God's children who have lived and died who may not even know of Christ, but were humble and accepted. There is something greater than me. There is something beyond myself, something that I, I want to understand, I want to commune with, I want to um, um, become familiar with and have a relationship with and will will forego my personal desires to understand that being, that entity, that great spirit or or however they would have um, categorized it or whatever terminology they would have used so that when it's offered to them saying, this is the entity, this is the being that you were seeking after and didn't quite understand who they were, of course they would accept it at that point because their heart was already in the right place to to accept it had they known about it at the time. And the beautiful thing is that the covenant path is applied individually. Mm. And we're reading in in Messiah here that it's the people speaking of one voice, like, you know, collectively. Yeah. But really what that's representing is each one individually mm-hmm. having this experience. And... That's just, it's it's such a beautiful thing that the ordinances are performed and will be performed for every single person who has ever lived. One by one. And every person will have the individual opportunity of entering and making these covenants. And no one is forgotten or left behind or it truly is a universal gospel and it's temple work is proof of the infinite love of God for his children. Go on to talk a little more about law of the gospel and law of consecration because these these chapters are really a master class in charity and consecration and probably something we should be reading over and over and over again right as to try to beat the Babylon out of us. <laughs> for real though. <laughs> yeah. Grip ourselves to pride. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just grabbed a few quotes here. Your substance doth not belong to you, but to God, to whom also your life belongeth. I mean, that's that's the principle of consecration, isn't mm-hmm. it? We're stewards. Yeah. Every what, when you when you can humble yourself to the point of recognizing that nothing is yours, even what you have is not yours, mm-hmm. because your life's not even yours, right? That's when when you truly grasp that and understand that. That's when. I think your heart starts to soften and consecration starts becoming more natural uh, because you you stop hoarding mm-hmm. and, and, and you start giving, right? This is what Christ was trying to teach the young rich man. Stop hoarding. Well, you, you have all that wealth that you're just hoarding and doing nothing with other than make, you know, so you making you feel good that you're rich. Well, liquidate that. Start start being charitable with, with the talents you've been given. Mm-hmm. And woe be unto the man who denies the beggar, for his substance shall perish with him. Now I say these things unto those who are rich as pertaining to the things of this world. And, I mean, let's be real, that's all of us. Yeah. Okay, I mean, at least Western English-speaking audience, in terms of the history of the world, we are the 1%. Yeah. All of us. Correct. It <laughs> doesn't matter how much you do or don't make. We are, we are by all historical standards we are all rich today and like we shouldn't we shouldn't exclude ourselves from these teachings or the or 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 this uh, this grouping of the rich just because 
you know, oh, I make less than my neighbor. Well, we're all we're all rich in in blessings, and we need to take this to heart. And then this is the verse we already read, verse twenty six. But he says this, like he's saying these things. He's teaching consecration and charity. Why? For the sake of retaining remission of your sins. Mm-hmm. If you enter into the covenant path. You find Christ, you accept Christ, and then do not follow him, meaning you don't walk in his footsteps and you don't try to emulate him and you don't try to change your heart and develop the type of character that he had, then you cannot retain that remission of sins. Yeah. Because the point of receiving the remission of sins, uh, of receiving that grace, is to be able to move forward and to progress and to grow and to become like he is. That's the whole point of the remission of sins. You know, one of the things I was thinking is sometimes people want to know, like, well, well, how do I know if I'm doing enough or if I'm giving enough, if I'm consecrating enough to retain this remission of sins? Or, or maybe they're not even thinking it in that way, but I'm doing enough to, to be looked at favorably in the eyes of the Lord, you know? The truth is, there's not a standard that can be dictated to you because it is a spectrum. It is a little bit of a sliding scale. Well, Today, last week, King Benjamin made it clear that it doesn't matter how much you do. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you can't do enough. You can't do enough. <laughs> but today, and through discernment, you can say, as of today, as imperfect as I am, here's what I know I can give. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount. And then a little bit of time goes by. And things get adjusted in your life or things change or you make a little more money or you you say, I don't really need to be paying for this or that anymore. And then two weeks from now or a month from now, you say, you know, I could probably give $50 more or $100 more or whatever it is. And you do that for a time. And then a few months go by and you say, you know, I could probably give another $50 or $100. The, the truth is you've got to use discernment and follow the spirit. And that's what the Lord wants us to do because it is different for everybody who is at a different place, a different stage in life. But if you're seeking that, if you're thinking about it, if you're pondering and meditating on it, like what can I give today? Am I consecrating what, what I can right now? And it may not be much and that's okay. But a few months from now, as you continue to ponder and think on it, you might say, you know, I'm in a position now where I can give a little more. I'm not going to miss it. You know, I don't need it. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't hoard it or, or, or I don't cherish it. It's just money, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. The, and you do a little more. Kind of that worldly ambition starts to yeah. be stripped from your heart. Yeah. And instead of thinking, me, 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 my, my, mind, yeah, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. You start saying, Hey, I, I have the Lord has blessed me with some conditions to do some good. Yeah. It's, it's just that self analysis to say, where am I? And can I do more? Can I give a little? It's looking for ways and opportunities to gl- give a little bit more. We talked a little bit about this on our Gospel Mysteries podcast um, about Zion, mm-hmm. the Covenant Society, about law of consecration. I mean, the first question is, do you, have you actually studied the law of consecration as it's taught in the Doctrine of Covenants and the historical context around that? How much do you understand? We we make covenants to keep the law of consecration, but have you studied it? Do we it? know what that Again? means? Do you yeah. know what that means? And that's kind of step one, I think, is just learning, you know, from a theoretical perspective, mm-hmm. how it worked, what it means, how might that apply to us today. And then once you, you know, once you grasp that, you know, and, and the wording is, you know, all that you have, mm-hmm. right? So it seems very, <laughs> very absolute. It's very inclusive. But we had, I had the missionaries <laughs> over a little while back and we were talking about this and that's the question one of them kind of just threw out there is like well how do you how do you know how much that is yeah and that's the, that's the exact question brigham young asked joseph and joseph said go go gather the excess of the saints and bring us well who's the judge what's excess mm-hmm. and joseph said let each man judge for himself yeah meaning discernment yeah that's right how how do you know how much you should be giving in fast offerings how do you know what how much of your time you should be be giving to to service and, and, and to your callings or whatnot, the answer is the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. The answer is there is no answer. Yeah. Like, for everybody. Well, yeah, I was going to say there is no standard. for The standard is follow the Spirit. The, the, it's a unique and individual answer for yeah. each and every one of That's us. That's correct. It's going to look different 
for every one of us. Mm-hmm. That's not a, that's not a question that any man can answer for you. Mm-hmm. You have to answer to yourself through prayer, through pondering, and through receiving inspiration from the Holy Ghost. And that's all there is to it. And that's really why tithing is the lesser law, because tithing is a standard. Say, hey, your ten percent of your increase. This uh, that's what you got to give. But really, that's not transforming your heart. It's not changing your perspective. It's not changing who you are. But when you kind of start living the higher law and you start proactively looking for, am I doing enough? Am I giving enough? Can I can I give a little bit more? What opportunities do I have to serve a little bit better, a little more faithfully? You know, that really starts to change your heart and change your perspective and and allows the Lord to really work within you. When you say, well, I'll meet the minimum, I'll meet the standard, and then I can turn off my mind and not think about it anymore, mm-hmm. that cuts the spirit off. Yeah. The spirit can't really work within you at that point. Well, that's, and that's the danger of the letter of the law. Yeah, that's exactly. the danger of thinking that there's salvation in living the law. Mm-hmm. And that's the danger. That's the danger. The, that's the trap the Pharisees fell into. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I'm doing the minimum required of me, therefore yeah. I'm saved. I've done enough. And now I'll go do what I want to do. That's exactly what yep. Christ, that's the mindset Christ was preaching against, saying, no, they got it. No. <laughs> Work on your heart. Yep. And then you'll actually go above and beyond what the law says. Mm-hmm. You'll do it bigger and better and more perfectly and more purely. And, and your small and simple things will be magnified and miracles will happen. That's what Christ was showing yep. during his ministry. You know, why, why weren't the miracles happening? For the Pharisees, because there it wasn't pure, it was not coming. There was not pureness of heart, and you know that's we talk. You know, I know it's common to say tithing's like a lesser law, but it's tithing's actually just a part of the law of consecration. It's fair. That's a better you know? way to look and at it. And it's like yeah. that's you're going to be consecrating all that you have, all of your excess. Let's say. And, you know, part of that, all, to, all the law of tithing says is that a designated part of that 10% goes specifically to the first presidency, to the bishop, yeah. for, for these specific administrative purposes, whereas the rest will go to the storehouse. Maybe tithing is kind of like the starter. It's like, okay, we need we need to, how, how do we start getting people to start thinking or getting getting trained or, or to start getting used to or... It's kind of preparatory, but still part of. Yeah, because prior to section 119, the revelation of, law of what we consider law of tithing today, mm-hmm. the church was using tithing just to refer to everything you were giving, all of your donations. Yeah. It wasn't like the 10 percent Abrahamic 10 percent that we you know that we think of today. Tithing was just your consecration; mm-hmm. it was what you were giving, and then and that was obviously that that was refined, and an application was was presented and to help the saints in being able to better understand and live the law of consecration and, and yeah start, start learning how it actually works it. yeah that makes sense uh talk a little bit more about discernment because this comes up <laughs> king, king benjamin brings this up and, and what his words are see that all these things are done in wisdom and order mm-hmm. it's not requisite that a man should run faster than he has strength so that's exactly what we're talking about there like it the mm-hmm. The story of the young rich man, it's my, one of my favorite stories in the scriptures. But Christ said, sell all you have and give to the poor. And we tend to think that means sell all you have and give all you have to the poor. But that's not what he said. He said, sell all you have and give to the poor. So Brigham Young taught that, right, careful reading of that shows that like Christ wasn't saying, hey, sell all you have and then you also be a beggar. Yeah. That's not what he become, was teaching. Become destitute. He was saying liquidate all those all those assets that you have, all that you have stored and you're hoarding, liquidate it and start doing good with it. Yeah. Like start like be an agent, start acting, start looking outward, not inward with it. That's exactly it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure if the young rich man had decided to follow that counsel, Mm -hmm. he probably would have had the same question. Well, how much do I spend? How do I administer it? And Christ would have said, follow the spirit. Mm -hmm. Like, let the let the works of God be manifest through you. That's the example. And do it in wisdom and order. Mm -hmm. Right. The point of consecration is not for everyone to be miserable. 
<laughs> to be beggars. The point of consecration is that the producers can provide for the non-producers, that those who have can help those who do not have. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, that the rising tides can lift all boats. Yep. That only happens if those who have are sharing of their abundance. Well, and the intent would be those that have not will eventually get to a point in which they are producers and have. Yes. And what do they do? They turn around and help others who are in need, mm-hmm. who are the beggars, who are the ones that do not have at that point. I think that should be obvious. Yeah. That, yeah. you know, the the goal for all in in Zion and in, in the covenant society is to progress. Well, that's essentially the eternal round in a very simple Eternal part. progression. Yeah, eternal yeah. progression. Today, we are all beggars. The hope is, the idea is that some of us and eventually all of us will no longer be beggars, that we will have attained a glory in which we can now turn around and share the plan of redemption with others. That's the point. I mean, that's exactly what consecration is teaching. And we're seeing that the spiritual applies to the temporal. Yep, exactly. They mirror each other. Mm -hmm. And he also shares the same, a similar topic of discernment about just uh, sin in general. And he's, and he's he's telling him, look, I can't tell you all things whereby ye may commit sin. There, are, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. So he's he's trying to give them a little lecture on, hey, like you need to avoid these falling into these sins, and you need to be doing good. But he's like, look, I can't I can't tell you how to live your life. Yeah, I can't tell you I can't micromanage your life for you, your spiritual life, your spiritual welfare. I can't do it. Right then, that's what we're talking. About. You have to develop this relationship with Christ, with the Holy Ghost, to be able to discern and be an agent to act. And I had this quote here that I love from President Nelson, where he said, "Personal revelation can be honed to become spiritual discernment. To discern means to sift, to separate, to distinguish. The gift of spiritual discernment is a supernal gift that allows members of the church to see things not visible and to feel things not tangible." And what and how I'm applying that here is that pers- personal revelation comes first. We learn the laws, we learn, we start not just to learn them, but to understand them, right? We have the eyes of our understanding opened. Mm-hmm. That's how the scriptures put it. Like when, um, And then once we understand the gospel, now we can have a discernment on how to apply the gospel in our life, our day-to-day life, in our unique situations that come up day to day, minute to minute, moment to moment. And that's that's what King Benjamin is trying to get the people to understand here. That's what we need to understand is that the purpose of the gospel, the purpose of the Holy Ghost, and the per- purpose of personal revelation is so that we can be true, righteous agents mm-hmm. to act. And we can use, you don't have to be commanded in all things, because we can discern good and evil and do good. Mm-hmm. Well, and that makes me think too, sometimes we we have access to personal revelation and we need to learn to to hone and harness that skill exactly as president nelson said but oftentimes many many of us have started to receive that personal revelation and and we've really worked to dedicate ourselves consecrate our efforts and and try to cultivate that spirit of revelation in our lives well then we go to the Lord and we start asking questions saying I need to understand X Y and Z and we feel like why do I not receive a very specific direct answer on this? Oh, am I not receiving personal revelation anymore? What am I doing wrong? And really I think what we forget is we have the ability and the access now to discern for ourselves. Like the spirit will help guide that discernment without necessarily giving us a direct, exact revelation that says, here's the path you need to go down. Here's the choice you need to make. The Spirit may not do that because the Spirit doesn't need to. Because part of this plan, part of the refinement we're going through is, we don't always need to be commanded or specifically guided like that in all things. We need to start learning to be agents to act and using that discernment. And sometimes it's okay for us to make that decision without... Here's direct revelation that's telling you exactly where to go. Because then, at a certain point, all you're doing is going where you're being told to go. You're not actively choosing righteous paths. You're not actively choosing to do the best thing or or the most righteous thing. And that's what the Lord's trying to prove us out to do. Are we willing to do the best thing, the most righteous thing, without 
having to be told to do it all the time. Yeah, and that's kind of like the good, better, best. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. And I think a good example of that is like the the recent changes to the strength of the youth, mm. where the strength of the youth used to be more detailed and specific on yeah. do this, don't do this. And now it's teaching principles and saying, no, go govern yourself according to these true gospel principles. It's like, well, that seems to leave more room for error. Maybe it does. Yeah, maybe it does. But it also right. leaves more room for righteous discernment mm-hmm. and for all of us to be agents to act within the gospel, mm-hmm. which allows us to be proved to a greater degree and come out the other side more refined and closer to Christ. Yeah. Well, that's the more pure, I mean, that's the true worshiping in spirit idea is that I don't have to be told or commanded in all things because I have that relationship now with the Lord. Living waters. Yes. I seek righteousness. I want righteousness. I desire it so that even if I don't receive exact direct revelation, where I am at this point. I can start to make choices and it may not be perfect, but it's the best I can do. And that's what the Lord's looking for. Like he's wanting you to just do the best you can do and he'll magnify it. That's the thing we forget. It's like, I don't have to be told exactly what to do from the Lord. He wants to sit and watch and say, will you do the best you can do? Because whatever it is, I can perfect it. I can magnify it. I can make it yeah. right. I can make it enough. You bring the loaves and the fishes. That's right. And I will feed the fire. I will make it enough. Yes. And that's the thing that we forget. It's like, no, I want to do it just right, Lord. Tell me exactly what I need to do. And he's sitting there saying, no, just do what you How can, can I do. feed the 5,000? Yeah. You can't. You yeah, Exactly. But you can bring what you've got. Yeah. And I can't. Yeah. That's the message. of. And that's what he's waiting. Do what you can do and then watch me work. Let but so many times we're so afraid, we just sit there like, okay, I'm going to wait on the Lord. And just when he tells me exactly what to do, I'll do it. It's like, no, no, no. He wants you to act and then he will magnify it. So that then you see his strength. You see the miracles. You see how great he really is. Mm-hmm. You did the best you could. And guess what? He took it and made it miraculous. I think there's some there's some beauty in the simplicity of who was it that brought the loaves and the fishes? What was a boy? Yeah. It was a child. So then adult probably would have been like, eh, this ain't enough. It's not enough. Or, yeah. or say, eh, I'll just, I should, I won't even bring it up. I'll just kind of eat this. Yeah, eat this it. is foolishness. I'm not going to do and this. The humility and the and the pure charity of a child, he, he brought forth a, his pathetic offering. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was not so, much. Just pathetic. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, I've got these <laughs> few loaves and fishes. Like, will, will this help? And of course, the apostles were probably like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, Somebody make this kid go sit down. <laughs> and then Jesus was like, I go work with him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the, we have to develop, that's the that's the whole thing of becoming like children and mm-hmm. and putting our faith in, in Christ, like childlike, pure faith. Mm-hmm. And believing and trusting in God. Yeah. And it's a simple slide. I just kind of took some quotes out of the manual here, but... It said, our trust in God increases as we have experiences with him. And that makes sense, yeah. right? That that falls in line with Alma's teaching of faith and and how faith becomes hope and, you know, belief becomes hope and hope becomes knowledge and knowledge becomes living faith. Yeah. And so the question is, how do we have experiences with God? Maybe there's lots of answers to that question. Yeah. Hearing the word acting on the word, applying the word. Um, But King Benjamin would say, serving others. Yeah. You're in the service of God, having experiences with God, being in the service of God, when you're serving your fellow man. And that's how we have experiences with God. What did Christ teach? When you've done good to the least of these, you've done it unto me. How do we have experiences with Christ? Well, we go and we consecrate what we have. We love others and we bless others. We do what he would do if he was in our shoes. And from a gospel perspective, I mean, what's our goal? What are we trying to get out of the gospel? Return to the presence of God. Enter into the presence of Christ. 
build a personal relationship, not just in spirit, but in person. Mm-hmm. Right? We're talking second comforter. So how can we enter into the presence of Christ? What do we need to do? Well, we need to be serving others. We need to be developing charity. And through a lifetime, serving others and having sacred experiences with other people, they come to know Christ. Yeah. That's the gospel. That's, that's the true fullness of the gospel that Christ has made available to each and every one of us. The covenant path, right, the legal administration, it all serves a purpose and it is important and it's, it's a teaching tool. It helps us get there, but it has to, it has to, it has to be born in our hearts. Mm-hmm. We, we have to have the born again experience and actually start living it. And it's line upon line. We don't run faster than we have strength. It could, it's a slow progress. And sometimes we get frustrated with, with how slow it is, but it's perfect and it's pure and it's true. One of the interesting things or something I've been thinking about lately is just this love consecration. And we tend to, from a, a person, from a human perspective, it's like, oh, we've, we got to give more to the Lord. We got to give more to the Lord. We're only looking at things one direction. And what we tend to forget and what I've been thinking and pondering on more lately is, well, why does the Lord ask us to do that? Because everything he does is perfectly living the law of consecration, meaning he's not taking what we give him and keeping it. Everything first, as King Benjamin mentions, everything's already his. But when we give to him, he immediately turns around and uses that outward looking, outward facing. He is living the law of consecration perfectly in himself. And when we talk about like inheriting, like we want to inherit eternal life, Sometimes I think like that's already being offered to us. It's already being made available to us and that it's our, it, it's, it's ours to lose. Like if we're serving, if we're giving, if we're having that Christ like charity and love, if we're truly living the law of consecration, we're already inheriting eternal life because that is eternal life. Like what he's offering, but we look at it like, well, I need to be a good person and I need to live righteously so that someday I can inherit eternal life with God. Well, you know, being in the presence of God. I get that there, obviously there's some, some additional things that need to be added upon us. But what I'm saying is eternal life is already being offered to us. That inheritance, it's already being given to us and it's ours to lose. Like when you, when you consecrate, when you love the way Christ loves, and we can't do that perfectly now, but we do the best we can do, you are living the eternal life God's promising. You're you're receiving that inheritance today. Yeah. And as you become more perfect in that, your inheritance grows, you know? So I just sometimes I think we put off for tomorrow what can be received now and received today. It's about changing our perspective and how we act. What you're talking about is grace. hundred percent. Yes. Receiving a fullness of that grace. And right. The trap is to think that, well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do the works. Mm-hmm. And then the grace comes after, after. Yeah. That's and right. that's, that's a false notion. That's right. Right. The grace, the grace is here and now and it's free. Well, the kingdom of God is at hand. Is it not? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't know that we fully understand or comprehend what Christ was teaching. Like it's all here. Mm-hmm. It's ready to be had. We just misinterpret what we think the kingdom of God is or is going to be because we're always future looking, you know? It's like, no, it's here now. We just got to learn what is the kingdom of God? How do we live in it? Mm-hmm. And and King Benjamin is teaching that. You consecrate, you give because the the what you get in return, that humility and that love and that peace, that's that's the inheritance we seek. That's the kingdom of God we should be after. So he talks about watching yourself Mm -hmm. in your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, observing the commandments, continuing in faith. And because if you don't, you perish or you don't retain the remission of sins. This is kind of, he's wrapping up his kind of coming full circle to, to his thought here. 
Um, and then he said, this is exactly what we're talking about. It's, um, this, this is where it's easy to interpret this as, okay, well, it's works. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you interpret the remission of your sin? Well, it's, it's through works. Well, remission of sins is obtained and retained only through grace. Correct. It is only through grace that we are saved, even after all we can do. Mm -hmm. However, the grace of Jesus Christ is an enabling power. Okay? The grace of Jesus Christ is what allows us to move forward walking blameless before God, even though we have all sinned and fallen short. It's, it's the enabling power that gives us hope and faith to go and do mm -hmm. with the belief that all things will work out and be okay. That we, that helmet, that, that, that we really have received that remission of sin, that is good, mm -hmm. that is valid. Now, when we get there and on that great dreadful day of judgment, that Christ is our advocate. Yeah. And everything's going to work out in our favor. And, I mean that's it's it's so important. We did a we we did a whole gospel mysteries episode on on grace and 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 works and original sin and atonement and how this all fits together. I mean, it's it's a topic you can go into very very deeply and in depth. But it's it's just you just can't overstate the importance of understanding and really applying in your heart the doctrine of grace. Mm -hmm. Everything flows from that. The whole concept of that big King Benjamin talks about that you're unprofitable. We're all beggars. Consecrate yourselves. Give to, that all flows from grace, mm -hmm. from understanding grace that we're all, because the flip side of that is that we're all being given freely of substance. We're all given life freely. All the blessings we have, they, it comes freely. Mm -hmm. And as we receive freely, we should also give freely. That's all the doctrine of grace. So even the works in that of loving God and loving others and doing good unto others, that all stems from grace. Without a foundation of grace, th there are no works. There are no works sufficient to overcome justice. That's right. There just aren't. Yeah, when when evangelicals say, say you are only saved by grace, that is true. The difference, according to our belief, when you really understand it, is grace has a greater enabling and magnifying power to where, yes, you are saved by grace, but what is the Lord seeking from us? See, that that perspective. What does the Lord want us to become? Well, he wants us to be refined. He wants us to be more like him. So we're saved by grace. He wants us to become as he is. Yes, exactly. And so we are saved by grace. That's it. End right there. That's correct. But as we attempt, as we give our best efforts to try, we do the best we try. Grace is a tool. It enables those efforts to help refine us, to help make us better. So today we might only do, you know, three or four or five percent of whatever it is we're capable of doing. But through the grace of Christ, he enables us to where we learn, we grow, we refine from that. And next time we try, we can give 7 or 8% or 9%. It is that enabling tool, that enabling factor that allows us to be refined, to become more than we are today. And that's, again, some of what we were talking about at the beginning, the difference between our understanding of grace and other Christian understanding of grace is, it is grace you're saved, period, at the end of the day. But when you properly apply grace, you can become refined to a greater extent as time goes by. It's that enduring to the end process of consistently allowing yourself to be refined and to become better and more than you were a day ago or a year ago or 10 years ago. And now we can move on to chapter five. All right, excellent. <laughs> the spirit of the Lord can cause a mighty change in heart. So all this is good in theory, right? Consecration, charity. But it's not something that we're supposed to be forcing ourselves to do. It's something that should be naturally flowing from a changed heart, from being born again in Christ. 
And this is the experience that the people had as a result of King Benjamin's uh, teaching here. This is where they cried in unison saying, We know of the truthfulness and surety of these things because of the Spirit of the Lord Omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil. They have discernment. Mm-hmm. Right? This is, this is the equivalent of now understanding the difference of, of good and evil and choosing good. And they want to do good continually. And we ourselves also, through the infinite goodness of God and the manifestations of the Spirit, have great views of that which is to come. Their, the eyes of their understanding are being opened. This is revelation. They're becoming uh, endowed by the Spirit here, essentially. And we're expedient. We could prophesy of all things. They have, right? Their eyes or their understanding is open to the full, the, the, the great eternal round of the plan of salvation. Yeah. And they can look ahead and they understand that Christ is to come. They understand the fullness of the gospel, right? Their, their hearts were full of the Spirit. I mean, this is a true day of Pentecost. Yeah. And, you know, in a, in a, in a pre-Christian world, right? Pre-New Testament world, right? But because they understood the doctrine of Christ, they were able to have these manifestations of the Spirit and have these things come upon them and have their eyes opened. And to the point where they said, we are willing to enter into a covenant Mm -hmm. with our God to do his will, to be obedient to his commandments and all things he commands us all the remainder of our days. So that's, what is that? Well, that's the baptismal covenant, isn't it? Yeah. So that's exactly what we were talking about here is that they had the spirit come upon them, the spirit of Christ. They felt that remission of their sins. They gained it. Mm -hmm. And what did that do? Right, that that moved them to the point that changed their heart, where they were willing to enter into a covenant mm-hmm. with God. We were, and that's that's the right. They started stepping forward in the covenant path. That's what King Benjamin said. Hey, now that you've received it, once you've received it, now retain it. Yeah. How covenants become the covenant people move forward on the path and uh, that, that Jesus Christ established. Mm-hmm. We were talking before how this kind of day of Pentecost is very obviously similar to the day of Pentecost in the New Testament that occurred before, you might say, the formal organization of the church and the the works of salvation, trying to bring others, bring this light and this truth to others and allow them to come into you know the body of Christ, the church, essentially. And here, the same thing's happening. This day of Pentecost is happening. And it it feels like, okay, this, this occurs before that formal organization will happen. But I almost think it's kind of the inverse, like we talk about a lot, where we assume, oh, there's a day pre, predestined or, 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 or already um, established when Christ is going to return. And we started to figure out, like, no, when the world is prepared, when enough people have built Zion in their hearts and in their homes, Christ will be able to come. It kind of seems like that as well to me, where when enough people are sufficiently humbled to receive this day of Pentecost, this outpouring of the Spirit, that's when the true organization now and the the formal ministry to bring salvation to others can start to happen. Right. It's not. It's kind of the cart before the horse kind of thing. It's like, well, no, actually, now that they're going through this humbling kind of penitent, penitent process, and they've allowed this this Pentecostal experience to occur, well, now the Lord knows. Okay, I can organize. I can organize a ministry. I can organize a formal structure here to expand the works of salvation. And that's what happened in the New Testament, and that's what's happening here. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because. I mean, that's part of the eternal round, is that the world is organized in a patriarchal order Mm -hmm. that grows to a degree, um, and then because of apostasy and everything that happens just by nature of man, fallen man, uh, it becomes, the patriarchal order loses its effectiveness, Mm -hmm. and it requires a more formal ministry and organization or a church to be established. And what's the purpose of the church? To reestablish to get back to the patriarchal order, the patriarchal order, order. Right. where where it can where where the fullness of joy can be experienced in its fullness and in its purity, mm-hmm. and I mean that's 
Eternal round, that's bro. the eternal round, right? And that's what we have today in the Church of Jesus Christ. Well, what's the purpose of the church? To get us to the temple. What's the purpose of the temple? To restore us to the patriarchal order. Yeah. And when that is 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 restored on the earth, the work is done. Mm-hmm. That's the that that's what we're doing. Yeah. That's the per- why are we building temples everywhere? Because we're trying to get people sanctified to a point where 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 our homes can be temples, and we have righteous patriarchs that are are living lives with pure discernment because they have made use of the Holy Ghost and personal rev- revelation to a point where they are honed mm-hmm. and they can discern and and raise up their children in righteousness and and that the work of God, the purposes of God, can be fulfilled naturally through that patriarchal order, through in families. Yeah, that's right. And now, because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, you are born of him and become his sons and daughters. And it shall come to pass that whosoever doeth this shall be found at the right hand of God. For ye shall know the name by which he is called. He shall be called by the name of Christ. So, again, what's the purpose of the baptismal covenant? To take upon ourselves the name of Christ. It's the initial step to truly doing that. And this born again experience here, this this is this is so important. This is what this is what allows Christ to be both the Son and the Father. Mm-hmm. He's both. He declares that over and over again in the scriptures. Yeah. And that, that seems co- contradictory or confusing, but he is both. And his role of the son is obvious mm-hmm. is always obvious but how is he but his role of the father can be a little 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 murky at times but it it's taught right here right it's taught right here by by covenant by making covenants with him that allows us to be called his children that is how we are spiritually begotten sons and daughters of Christ. What does that mean? It means Christ is the rightful heir to the Father, and that through our covenants with Christ, we become heirs of the same through him. So, in that sense, he is now, our access to the Father's inheritance comes through our adopted Father, our spiritual Father, who is now Christ legally by legal covenants yeah by legal contracts that have been recorded on earth and in heaven saying as much and you really can st- when you start pondering this and putting this together and understanding this you really start to see the magnitude the magnificence and the glory that Jesus Christ has and what he offers to us he is the access to the fullness of the Father, and He offers it freely to us, despite <laughs> who we are, what we've done. We spend a lot of effort. And I think, I think we've allowed ourselves. Generally, I shouldn't paint everyone with this brush, but generally, as a church, we have allowed the conversation around the Godhead, the Trinity. What does that really mean? To 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 create these very rigid lines and to kind of paint ourselves into a corner that need not be so. But because we want to correct and to address the Trinity as it has kind of been canonized in the rest of Christendom, n- not ubiquitously, but most of Christendom, has this idea of the Trinity of of being all one person, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and we try to fight that so hard to say, no, the Father is an entity, the Son is an entity, the Holy Ghost is an entity, 
all be and, and they're three separate personages. We try to fight that so well, we've hard. Taken the doctrine of multiple tabernacles mm-hmm. that the father and the, that there is a father and there is a son and they have bodies. Mm-hmm. Like we we ran with that so hard. Yes, that it it, it it's confused us. Well, we've pigeonholed yeah. Christ as to just being the son, like. I don't want to say that's it, but it's like, that's, that's his place. He must stay right there. He is just the son and there is a father corporally, physically. That is true. He is the son of a heavenly father from a spiritual perspective, though, we are seeking to be sealed to him. He will become our spiritual father. And, and if we don't have that if we don't seek that if that's not what we want and we can't visualize that Mm -hmm. there's a problem it's we've got a we're falling very short of what the eternal goal will be and what's available to us we need to look at him as well as not just the son of god not just our savior and our older brother as you mentioned previously but he is seeking to be sealed to us as our spiritual father to lead and guide us into the next phase of the eternal round and we've got to start having reverence for him in that manner and stop trying to just keep him in this box of the son of course that's who he is but he is also so much more for us for for us moving forward and we've got to start looking forward to that day and what's the purpose of the book of mormon self-declared in the title page to teach and show that Jesus Christ is the eternal God. That's correct. And amen to to everything you just said. That if our relationship with Christ stops at understanding that he's the only begotten of the Father mm-hmm. and our elder brother who offers salvation, that's falling way, short. way short of where of where we need to be in our in our relationship with him. Yeah. We need to understand that through him, through our covenants with him, our relationship is much greater than yeah. that. And 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 he becomes spiritually we spiritually our father. Mm-hmm. We are spiritually begotten through him. All of the blessings of the Father are available to us in and only through him and therefore we are spiritually begotten to him in all legal aspects and all he is our father yeah there is n- none of the blessings of the father are available to us mm. without him yeah if not through him we when we talk about the book of mormon containing the a fullness of the gospel there's a lot of ways in which we've we've kind of discovered and talked about and kind of theorized like, well, what does that really mean? This may be the most important thing. This may be the key of what is it teaching? Because what the Book of Mormon is teaching us is it's not just correcting the incorrect traditional Trinitarian view of the Godhead, but it's also correcting us and some of the views we've kind of set up and 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 been really rigid on it's showing us like no christ is greater than that it's providing clarity philosophies of men seep in within our own culture 100 percent and the book of mormon makes it very clear who christ is and how important he is and how close we should be to him moving forward in our eternal progression Mm -hmm. in the book of life and in the book of the eternities we will always write down Who is your eternal father? It will be Jesus Christ moving forward. If we live our life correctly, if we live our life the way we should be living our life, he will be the one in our family tree that we point to and say, that is our father. And that is extremely humbling and very profound to really start considering when we look at how our relationship should be with him because you think about how your relationship is with your earthly father and it's just awe inspiring to think we will and have the opportunity to develop that same relationship and closeness with him and i don't think it's coincidence that the few very few appearances of the father himself that we have in scripture 
the only thing he does is introduce his son. Yep. He, the role of the father is to point us to the son. Mm-hmm. That should make it as clear as day. Yeah. That who Jesus is, who Jehovah is, he is, if we accept him and co- make covenants with him, he's being presented as our salvation, as our spiritual father. He is being presented as the father for us. The father is presenting him to do his will, yeah. to be him, to serve as him for us, to serve, to give the salvation that he wants for us, to give everything he wants to give us. He gives us a spiritually adopted father. It makes me think, I haven't, I haven't thought too deeply about this before, but we focus a lot on the father sacrificing his only begotten son for us. But when I think about Christ and I try to put myself kind of in his perspective, why did he have so much compassion and love and ki- and care for, for us willingly sacrificing himself because he didn't just look at us as as brothers and sisters to him he turned around and looked at us and said these are my children these are my sons and my daughters he had that parental love that patriarchal love that we've been talking about for each of us and that's such a deeper more profound love that you would willingly give, I mean, who would not willingly give their life for their children to say, I love this child so much. If it means I've got to go fine, I want them to continue. I want their progression to continue. That's ultimately the, the perspective Christ had that fatherly love, that patriarchal love to say, gladly, I will lay down my life so that my children can continue to progress yeah. and have an opportunity well, to to be with me. Those that the Father had given him. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Gives more depth, too, to him saying we need to become his children. Exactly right. Yeah. And it's not just if who we are, mm-hmm. but we need to become as his children. Yeah. There's, there's more depth to that, too, when you yep. when you look at it through this. That's... Okay, I, I think we need to do a whole episode on the God, yeah. <laughs> our gospel mysteries episode. We've been talking about it, but it's deepening where we need to go with it for sure. It's becoming more clear. All right, got a couple good quotes here. Elder Christofferson. with covenants, we are intent on more than just avoiding mistakes or being prudent in our decisions. We feel accountable to God for our choices and our lives. We take upon us the name of Christ. We are focused on Christ, on being valiant in the testimony of Jesus, and on developing the character of Christ. What's the purpose of covenants? To help us progress and be more like he is. Mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not about better living the letter of the law because that's where, because you're saved by the law. No. It's about entering into a personal relationship with God so that we can be accountable to him. And using that as our enabling power, right, taking hold of that grace through this covenantal tool that we have to then tap into eternal progression and be emboldened and empowered with the ability to develop the character of Christ. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. What's the work of God to help us become as he is? Eternal life and exaltation. And you can only get there through grace and redemption, but you can also only get there by slowly over time developing the divine nature. And Christ had it naturally, right? That, but that was his example. That it's not impossible; it can be attained. It's not going to happen in this life for us. It's something that is part of the eternal round 
That's part of the eternal plan of salvation. It's something that we are striving towards and will continue to strive towards. Right? There's right that that's another misrepresentation of our doctrine. I think that people of other faiths often think is that oh, like you know, we we think oh that we're gonna immediately like we we have in our head that we can be equal to God. It's like that's that's not yeah. There's only one that 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 can, will, and did attain that. Yeah, and that was that was Jesus Himself. Like that's not what we believe. We believe that there is a process of getting there. Mm-hmm. That God and Jesus, they have the power to get us there. Mm-hmm. They absolutely do. They are all powerful, even unto the perfecting of us. Mm-hmm. But that's something that is part of our eternal progress. That's part of the eternal plan. That's that's, that's what is available to us in the eternities through the grace of Jesus Christ, we could tap into yeah. here and now. And that's the power of covenants, is to help us tap into, in the fullest and most complete way possible, the process of developing the character of Christ, yeah. the divine nature. You know, this this might be a really bad analogy. It is a really bad analogy. I'm going to give it anyway, though. Just to try to illustrate how important covenants are, because we have gotten feedback from time to time from folks who don't believe what we believe and they'll say something akin to some of these things don't matter anymore covenants don't matter because you're saved by faith and by grace you know and it's that relationship that that, that's all that matters you know you have faith in christ and you're saved by grace i mean they they take they they'll use word they'll say something to the effect of well grace is the new covenant yeah yeah the problem with that is basically that relationship that you're setting up is a man and a woman who really genuinely love each other and care about each other. They're even going to live together, but there's no legal covenant binding them together. There's no, there's nothing that's saying these two have, have made the commitment and as such qualify for certain opportunities or, or certain benefits that those who have not made that covenant have not, now, I'm not comparing the covenant God make with us to temporal, celestial, worldly covenants. But what I am saying is there is a difference between loving, caring for somebody and being in a relationship with them and it then loving and caring somebody and legally binding yourself yeah. to somebody. And that's what these covenants are, is not legally binding according to our law, but legally binding ourselves, taking his name, taking Christ's name upon us according to celestial law. Yeah. Something that cannot be broken unless we obviously choose to to back out of it. A a an, an eternal bind that will never be parted. Yeah. That's what we're seeking in the covenantal relationship. And that's what I think a lot of other Christian uh believers miss out on is they are living and are seeking a relationship with Christ that that is not eternal. There's no spirit of promise there. Whereas the covenantal relationship we obtain through authority and through through willingly entering into these covenants, mm-hmm. it is eternal. It is celestial. And that starts at baptism. And it goes all the way through the rest of the covenants we willingly partake of. Yeah, that I mean there's there's benefits to coming unto Christ. Regardless of the church or the source. The relation, yeah, however it's established, yep, there's that benefits. That you can tap into for this life. Yep, correct. And there is a degree of light and truth you can develop on your own mm-hmm. that will carry forward, mm-hmm. regardless of the kingdom of glory you end up in. But the fullness of God's blessings that are available, what we really consider eternal life or eternal lives, it's defined. Yep. And it's... it's, and it's it's controlled by immutable celestial eternal law. There is a law irrevocably decreed from heaven. And this is the way, like this is the law that has been decreed and it's open and available to all, Mm -hmm. but you've got to willingly participate. You got to see it and then enter, see the the kingdom and then enter that kingdom. And legal authority or priesthood is, and always was paramount. Yep. That's right. Essential to that plan. Another quote here from President Nelson. Your commitment to follow the Savior by making covenants with him 
and then keeping those covenants will open the door to every spiritual blessing and privilege available. That's, I mean, that's the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's the gospel. That's just them. Amen. That's Perfect. all you can say. Perfect quote. Yeah. Well, this wraps us up with what the manual had. I, the manual kind of forgot that chapter six existed, I think. <laughs> A pretty short chapter, and it just kind of wraps up King Benjamin and says, okay, they wrote down the name of everyone who was present and, uh, you know, passed the reins over to King Uzziah, yep. or to his son. But I think there's some, actually, some doctrine there that is very delicious. Mm-hmm. And in in the doctrine that why did he take down the names of all those who had entered into a covenant with God to keep his commandments? Why re- why record it? Well, the doctrine is priesthood. Yeah. And the priesthood gives power to bind on earth and in heaven. What is bound on earth can be bound in heaven. Doctrine and Covenants then teaches that an alternate translation of that would be the priesthood gives power to record on earth and have it recorded in heaven. And this relates to the book of Revelation, where it's talking about being judged out of the books. Right? You're being judged out of the written records. I guess today they're probably computerized records. Yeah. But the records, nonetheless, that have been documented by legal administrators, by priesthood, by the church as it, as it stands today. Out of the books will we be judged. And... So why was King Benjamin recording everyone who essentially was baptized figuratively? I'm, I'm sure they were baptized after this. Yeah. Just didn't specifically yeah. call it out. Why was he recorded? Because he, he was recording in the book of life that these people had made the covenant. And through priesthood being recorded on earth, that covenant was then recorded in heaven. And, um, I mean, what, like, why, why is this? How is this relevant to look, the, the, what's coming next to the Book of Mormon? Because it, what's what it seems to me essentially, this is the beginning of. Actually, I think I had this on the next slide. This is the beginning of the Nephite Church. Mm-hmm. We had been in this patriarchal order, like we were talking, like starting with Lehi, this patriarchal order, Nephite patriarchal order, and it had branched out and the apostasy had hit and, and and then we have the gospel still being taught and then this multitude of people being gathered in. So now it's becoming necessary to start organizing the church for the benefit of of all the Nephites and the Lamanites and everyone who was in the Americas. And this King Benjamin recording, making the record of all these uh, people entering into the covenant is really the first records of of the Nephite church that's going to start being built, and you know we're going to see it grow and become more and more organized with Alma and mm-hmm. and moving forward. Um, but the church being organized and being prepared to receive the Messiah, yeah. right, is happening now, and that's what we see here in verse three, where it's it's saying Messiah, right, is officially becoming king, but then what? What else did King Benjamin do? Well, then he appointed priests to teach the people, that thereby they might hear and know the commandments, and to stir them up in remembrance of the oath or the covenant which they had made. So, this it is uh, in chapter six here. We're seeing the beginnings of the Church of Jesus Christ being established in preparation for to receive Him when He comes. Yes, and. This is very important, like very important teachings about priesthood and the role of the church and how it interacts with the patriarchal order and and everything we had kind of already talked about up to this point. But um, short couple in short chapter, short couple of verses that seem kind of just uh, just you, you might just kind of think there's not a lot of doctrine there, but in reality, there's a lot of doctrine there on priesthood and and that applies to the church to this day. Yeah. That was very alive and active in how the church operates today. Well, it's not it's not coincidental that the church starts to get established here and then sh- shortly I sh- should say shortly, but hereafter you have 
the the sons of Mosiah who go out and um, start becoming great missionaries and even start converting, you know, others who don't have those patriarchal figures in their life to lead them in righteousness. The missionary efforts can really expand and bring people into the 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 fold of of Christ being part of of um, you know him being their shepherd who don't have that lineage and that that um, that ancestry of righteousness you know really starts opening the door for the church and for salvation to be offered to any and all that will receive it and several of the following stories not only in Mosiah, but obviously leading into Alma and Alma the Younger and everything that happens, they can all be traced back to kind of this episode where the church is established and now they can go out and bring people in who their father, their fathers might be totally wicked, you know, and uh, and yet they're able to convert and bring many souls unto Christ through this process. I know these things are true. And I think there's great there's great power in many of the things we've talked about today. Yeah. And understanding who Christ is, understanding the true relationship we should be seeking to establish with him, and understanding the purpose of the church, understanding the nature of the patriarchal order and the nature of priesthood and the fullness of priesthood. These are all doctrines of salvation. These are not light doctrines. These are not things that should we should be trifled with. Right? King Benjamin said as much when he started talking. He's not he did not bring us here to trifle with these things. These are things that are of, inter- of eternal importance and that in my testimony is that if we take them to heart and we dedicate time to understanding them and seeking out the best books and the words of living prophets and apostles of our dispensation and and the other scriptures that are available to us. These are words of life. These are words of eternal life. These are words of salvation. These are words and principles and doctrines that will truly, can truly bring us to Jesus Christ. And I feel that in my bones. I know that that these things are true and that they have power. And it, I try my best Right to, to to live by these things, and I, you know, I fall short. We all do, but grateful to have a Savior who offers remission of sins and a covenant path to retain that remission of sins. I know He lives. I know these blessings are true and they're available to us. And I lean my testimony to these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The only thing I might add to that is start thinking, do I see the kingdom of God in my life today? Because the kingdom is here. It's at hand. And are you saying it? And if you're not seeing it and you're not feeling the power that comes from being in the kingdom of God, there's probably areas to to, to change. There's things that need cleaned up. There's some sort of repentance and this is why President Nelson talks about daily repentance something that needs to occur to strip ourselves of pride or whatever it may be that's preventing us from seeing the kingdom of God at hand and this is something I'm trying to work on lately I've been thinking about more and and I just feel impressed to invite others to start waking up in the morning and start asking yourself do I see the kingdom of God in my life today and if not, why not? And how can I start seeing it? How can I receive power from being being a part of that kingdom? I think as we start putting it that way and start thinking of Christ as the head of that, as, as the spiritual father we're seeking to be sealed to, it can really change our perspective and change our lives. He lives. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is our brother but he is also seeking to be our eternal father. And I testify of him in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.